Hello, and welcome to Loyola Marymount University. My name is Dennis Draper, and I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. Each year, we are fortunate to bring in a number of prominent business executives and special guest speakers to participate in our CBA lecture series. From high-ranking government officials, to leading journalists, to internationally acclaimed social entrepreneurs, all of our distinguished speakers share one common goal, to educate our students and local community on some of the biggest issues in global business today, all while reinforcing LMU's underlying mission of teaching business with ethics and social responsibility. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Welcome to Paul A. Grosh Lecture Series. My name is Mahmoud Nurayi, and I'm grateful for the support of our alumni and friends of the accounting department who have uh, provided contributions to the Paul A. Grosh Endowed Professorship. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Mr. Calkins is an internationally recognized expert speaker and the author of many books in advanced cost management, performance improvement systems. He is the founder of Analytic-Based Performance Management, an advisory firm located in Cary, North Carolina. Gary received BS degree with honor in industrial engineering and operation research from Cornell University. He received his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. In 1981, he started his work in uh, consulting with Deloitte. In 1988, he joined KPMG uh, Consulting. 1992, he headed National Cost Management Consulting Services for Electronic Data Systems, EDS, now part of HP. From 90, 1997, Till recently, he worked with, uh, as a business development uh, individual with SAS, a leading provider of enterprise performance management and business analytics and intelligence software. He's written many books. His most recent book, co-authored with Larry Maisel, Predictive Business Analytics, published by John Wiley's son. Um, very pleased to welcome Gary Calkins to LMU campus. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you, Mahmoud. It's a pleasure to be here. There was a mistake in Mahmoud's introduction. He referred to me as an expert. I'm not an expert. But I don't believe there's experts in any fields anymore. I think there's just way too many interdependencies between time and cost and quality and service level and capacity management and so forth for anybody to be an expert. And I'm pretty humbled by what I continue to learn. And there's a lot of young people here. Don't stop learning. Um, I mentioned earlier to the private breakfast or d uh, dinner per people, uh, I think careers have a lot more to do with luck and circumstances than being smart and competent. I had a couple of lucky breaks in my life, but uh, one of them was being trained by Professor Robert S. Kaplan of the Harvard Business School in the 80s on activity-based costing. And some of you know Kaplan's name from the balance scorecard, but he did earlier uh, work on activity-based costing, which we'll talk about. But uh, you know, preparation meets opportunity. I need to manage your expectations. Um, this talk is going to be like an MBA curriculum in 45 minutes. I may go 50 minutes. Um, and, but I do want to share uh, one other thing. This thing about writing books, um, it really was luck. Um, the third one, activity-based cost management, was a result of being trained by Kaplan and implementing uh, this uh, costing technique in the 80s 
And once I did that, it's like, wow, it's easy to write a book. You just take a bunch of PowerPoints and you put storyboard text in front and back and it just sort of the journey, you know, kind of continued. Um, I do have spent most of my life in the CFO accounting space, but I like to say that I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. And we'll talk about the difference between financial accounting and management accounting uh, in a few minutes. So who will benefit from this presentation? Managers, I guess I should have said, and students who have previously struggled at promoting financial planning and analysis, enterprise performance management, and integrating business analytics into their decision support systems. Managers who intend to champion any or all enterprise performance management and business analytic improvement techniques, and they need a compelling call to action. And the reason I have champion in quotation marks is it's just been my observation that all it's really nice to have senior executive sponsorship for initiatives and new programs. Oftentimes, those men and women at the top are preoccupied with firefighting or short-term priorities. It's oftentimes managers one, two, three, four levels down from the C-suite at the top that have sort of passion and say, wow, how long do we want to perpetuate using some of these stale or old techniques? And there's the ones who will do pilot programs or rapid prototyping or proof of concept methods to demonstrate to their colleagues, and they're the ones that actually sell it. So I actually like really presenting to middle managers in contrast to the executives. I'd like to start with three questions that I think are kind of fundamental to this whole talk. What, so what, and then what? What I mean by this is that when an organization does put in one of the types of methods which I'll describe later, like a balance scorecard or strategy map, they're going to learn a lot more about themselves that they did not know before. But that's the what. The so what is, there's so much information, where do I focus? What's relevant? But the then what is increasingly going to be the most important question. When we make decisions, what will the impact be? And all decisions usually only impact the future. So we drop a product line, we add a new customer segment, what will be the financial results? And we'll talk about the then what in a few minutes. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to clarify the confusion and lack of consensus about what is this enterprise performance management. It's typically perceived far too narrowly as a CFO initiative with a bunch of dashboards. It's much broader. Similarly, I'll try to clarify what's this business analytics. Then I'm going to basically talk about the eight pro pressures that have caused interest in performance management, because in a few minutes you're going to discover enterprise performance management is not a new thing people have to learn. It's it's, these methods have been around for decades, arguably some even before computers, so why is there interest in it? And at the end, I'll bring it all together. So let's get going. Put on your seatbelts. I'm going to talk fairly quickly. I think this cartoon sets the stage for the entire talk. Drowning in data, but starving for information. You have this clerk frowning, sad, shoulders hunched, paper all around. The supervisor at the left in the doorway is saying, it looks like you have all the data. What is the holdup? I gave you the request this morning. Why don't you have the answer? And there's so much information, but how do we basically make sense out of it? So I said there's confusion and lack of consensus about enterprise performance management. Is it human resources? If you Google just performance management, the majority of the hits will be HR, you know, employee appraisals, that kind of stuff. Uh, the problem is we didn't put the enterprise, the corporate performance management, that adjective in front of it, because this is really about the enterprise as a whole, not the individual, although they certainly contribute. Is it about scorecards, dashboards, key performance indicators and measures, as well as aligning the employees with the strategy? And that's the whole balance scorecard strategy map from Kaplan and Norton. We'll talk briefly about that, but that's just a subset. Is it about process, productivity, and quality improvement? Yes, but that's business process management. Processes are these end-to-end -end activities. We're talking about the broader umbrella. So this is the area of Six Sigma and lean management, but it's not the total answer. You know, is it all of the above? And the answer is yes, it's all of the above and even more. You know, the good news is this. Enterprise performance management is not a new method or process or system that people have to learn, but rather it's the integration of existing methods most managers and employees are already familiar with, and in some cases, they're actually doing them inside their own company. The problem is most of these organizations implement these in isolation of each other. You know, it's as if the one project team's in one building and another team's in another. They're like in parallel universes. You get a lot more power and integration when you integrate them like gears in a machine where each gear is like one of these methods and even more power when you spice them or in, embed in each of them analytics of all flavors, you know, which we'll talk about a couple of examples. 
Um, so, because I believe I'll provide the PDF to Mahmoud, you'll be able to get these slides. This is the definition that I just described. But I want to add that it, I said it's especially about predictive analytics, um, and it's all about decision making. Make no mistake, this is about better decision making. So let's talk about business analytics. What is it all about? Well, there is confusion and lack of consensus about what business analytics is. Is it a data warehouse? Is it data mining with career and reporting, you know, the ability to drill down to a purchase order or an invoice to a line item? Is it about business intelligence with enhancements? And I'm going to basically contrast business intelligence with business analytics. They're not the same thing. Business analytics is a step above business intelligence. Is it the technology of data governance, data management, data quality? Yes, but that's kind of the IT shop, you know, the men and women in the glass house that are running the big servers. It's about probabilities and statistics, like regression and correlation analysis, or forecasting and optimization equations. And I can share with all of the students in the back, I have some older people here in front of me that they took these courses in college and they said to themselves, I just want a passing grade and be out of here, <laughs> right? Well, the good news is, well, is you don't have to learn this stuff anymore, but the important news is you want to have those capability and skill sets in an organization because those analytic people are going to be able to make a competitive advantage for an organization. So it's probably all of the above. So rather than provide a definition of business analytics, and I could go to Wikipedia and stick it on the PowerPoint or go to Tom Davenport and Jeannie Harris's book. That's a competing on analytics. That was sort of a breakthrough book. You know, my belief is the way you want to look at this is work backwards with the end in mind. Know what problem or opportunity there might be and see if you can apply analytics to it. Regardless how analytics should be defined, there should be no argument as to what is its purpose. And it's real simple. It's about better decisions and better actions on those decisions. Analytics goals should be to gain insights and foresight and solve problems to make better and quicker decisions with more accurate and fact-based data and to take actions. So I lied to you. That's probably a pretty good uh, definition, even though I said I wouldn't give you one. Let's contrast business intelligence from business analytics. Business intelligence reporting consumes stored information. Increasingly, BI, its acronym, is being marginalized as reporting. What business analytics does is it produces new information from the stored information. And what these enterprise performance management methods do is they will deploy different types of analytics for the different type of problem that they're uh, to, to pursue. And I'll give a couple of examples during the talk. Insights and actions. Queries simply answer questions. But what business analytics does is it creates questions. Further analytics then stimulate more questions, more complex questions, and more interesting questions. And most importantly, business analytics also has the power to answer the questions. And I'm going to get serious here, although probably some of you are saying you really sound like you're serious, but let me just say that in my last 40 years, I think the best leaders and executives had the best answers. Today, I don't think that's the case. I think the best leaders and the best executives had the best questions. There is way too much complexity and volatility and uncertainty in this age with globalization for these executives who are promoted to the top based on their wisdom or gut feel or intuition or politics to pull it off. They have to create a culture for investigation and discovery and tolerance for making mistakes. They just aren't going to be able to make it out. Oh, I'm so smart. So I said that these enterprise performance management methods are not new. Some of them have been around for decades, arguably before computers. So why is there so much interest in this topic? What I want to do is briefly go through these eight pressures or forces that have caused the interest and then I will drill into four of them in a little more detail. The first one is executives' frustration with strategy failure. Executives are quite good at formulating strategy or they'll bring in a high-end consulting firm like McKinsey or Booz Allen. Their big frustration is failure to successfully execute the strategy. And there's a fair amount of empirical evidence of this. The turnover rate, involuntary turnover rate of CEOs is setting 
all-time records. Board of directors post Enron are not basically in a ceremonial role where you show up and get your thousand bucks. They're taking governance quite seriously. And examples like Carly Fiorini and not the thing about Republican versus Democrat, but you know, she didn't basically execute the strategy and HP pulled the plug on her. Second, increased accountability. Today and in your lives, there will be no place to hide for employees. Everyone will be monitored. It doesn't mean that their jobs are at risk, but it means that their promotability, perhaps salary increases, will be jeopardized. Three, more rapid decision making. Unlike five or 10 years ago, you could test and learn, sit in conference rooms with your supervisor. Today, employees will be on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. It's real-time decision making. And those employees wish that the executive was sitting in that chair so they would know what would they basically do. But if they have the strategy communicated to them in a way they can understand it, they'll make the right decision. And we'll talk about strategy maps in a, in a minute. Four, mistrust of the management accounting system for transparency and accuracy. This may surprise you, but many, many managers in a company, line managers, do not trust the accounting system. They think it's flawed and misleading. It may reconcile in total, but not in the parts. We'll talk about how activity-based costing resolves that. Five, poor customer value management. I really believe that what's happening today is customers view all suppliers as a commodity. They view banks as all having the same kind of deposits, same kind of services. Therefore, for suppliers to really compete, they need to provide differentiated services to different types of customers. They're all not doing it well. When we get to that section, which I will drill into, we'll talk about how the CFO can support marketing and sales. Six, contentious budgeting, poor resource capacity planning. I'm probably gonna shock some of you in the room, maybe all of you. I think the budgeting process is so broken. It is such a disaster. Uh, it's out of date in a couple of months after six months of preparing it and has all these problems of managers who pad the budget and I think the best solution is just destroy it, abandon it, just stop budgeting. But then you have to ask the question, what was the purpose of a budget in the first place and then can we replace what its purpose was and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Dysfunctional supply chain management, I'll be quick on this because many of you won't get into supply chain management. The problem there is most customers do not trust their suppliers. In fact, they view their suppliers as enemies. They pound on their suppliers. That's got to stop. They have to basically work together and collaborate because you've got supply chains competing against other supply chains for a share of wallet or purse. And there are huge opportunities between the interface between trading partners, especially in the distribution and channel you know, area. And so they need to find mutually beneficial projects and initiatives where they can save each other money. And the eighth one, which is probably the most interesting, the eighth fourth, is unfulfilled return on investment promises from large IT systems or lack of integration. And the observation I'll make here is if you ask a CIO that three years later after they put in a large ERP system from like SAP, Oracle, IBM, Infor, JD Edwards, and I'm not taking cheap shots at these vendors, you know, did you get the ROI that that software salesman told you you would three years earlier after all that work? Many of you would say, I don't think so. That does not mean they should not have gone ahead and put that ERP system. They do have to do it. The problem is the ROI is buried in that data like seeds in the ground. And what these enterprise performance management methods, which I'm going to start to describe, does is it releases the ROI and makes it profitable. So here are the four I'm going to drill down. Let's, uh, I'm going to keep my eye on the clock, being a good industrial engineer. You know, the trains run on time. Let's start with that first force. Failure by executives to ex execute their well-formulated strategy. And the solution that addresses this is the strategy map and the balance scorecard. And you can see that they're coupled here. And this is, comes from Kaplan and Orton. Uh, but above that is really something probably more important. It's the vision and mission statement. And that must come from the executives. In my mind, the executives have two jobs. Hire and grow good employees, like many of you when you get into jobs, and basically set direction. Set direction. They need to answer the question, where do we want to go? But what the performance management methods answer is a different question. How will we get there? What are the projects? What are the initiatives? What are the processes we need to improve? 
Now, The Balance Scorecard, the first book by Kaplan and Norton, is over 10 years old, and many organizations allegedly claim they have a balance scorecard. I'm not sure there's consensus of what it is, but what surprises me is very few organizations have a strategy map, and I believe that the balance, that the strategy map is 10 times more important than the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard is just a feedback mechanism. The real intelligence and the GPS is in the strategy map. Strategy map and scorecard, they're mechanical. They help realize the vision and mission. They're one of those gears that I describe, but a really important gear with a lot of torque. Now, this is not a four-hour training session, but real quickly, this is a fictitious picture of a strategy map. What Kaplan and Norton recognized is that executives were overreacting to financial results at the end of the period. They said, you need to shift your attention to non-financial information collected during the period and react to it. And they created these four perspectives that have cause and effect relationships from bottom to top. And at the lowest level is the learning and growth and innovation. This is the soft part where the employees are. And so if the employees are accomplishing those objectives, they'll contribute to the internal process improvement objectives. And if they're accomplishing those, they'll contribute to the customer satisfaction and loyalty objectives. So this is like a force field in physics where you're aligning the behavior and priorities of the employees, kind of like vector analysis if you've had a little engineering, you know, kind of like the crew in the Olympics all rowing in the right direction but in three dimensions. And all of those arrows, think of those as KPIs or measures, only two to three per, per KPI. You don't have to have a lot. You can't have hundreds of measures. You can have hundreds of measures, but they all can't be a K, okay? So to summarize, a learning environment will stimulate process excellence. Process excellence will lead to customer intimacy. That customer intimacy will then create the financial value. Let's move to another force. Mistrust of the management accounting system and its flawed cost allocations and misleading cost reporting of outputs, products, standard service lines, channels, customers, and outcomes. Occasionally, someone in the audience will say, I think there's a typo there. You've got cost allocations. You meant misallocations because it's being misallocated. I'm being charged by the accountants for this thing. I got nothing to do with it, but those two departments over there are causing all of it. But the accountants are allocating it on some factor like labor input hours that's got nothing to do with me. So that really has started to what lead to Kaplan's interest in activity-based costing. And part of it was because indirect expenses was beginning and is continuing to be much larger relative to direct expenses. And this is because companies have so much diversity and variation of outputs, colors, sizes, ranges, compared to what it was in the 1950s. White refrigerators or black refrigerators, that's all you got. Now you've got 100 colors. It creates complexity. Complexity calls more indirect. That indirect has got to be traced. So the simplest way to understand ABC is this little story. Imagine you go to a restaurant with three other friends. You order a little salad, and the other three order the most expensive item on the menu and a glass of wine. And at the end of the meal, when the waiter or waitress brings the bill, the other three say, hey, let's split this check evenly. How do you feel? Not fair. Not equitable. Well, that's how products feel in a standard cost accounting system from a general ledger when the accountants take this large single blob of indirect expense, commonly called overhead, and allocate it on these broad brushed averages like direct labor input hours, machine hours, number of units produced, sales dollars, square feet, it does not reflect the unique consumption of the individual end-to-end -end processes of these products and the activities that belong to them. So if you were to trace the consumption relationship proportionally, you'd discover some of those products are overcosted and the others must be undercosted because it's a zero-sum error game. It may reconcile on the total and satisfy the auditors, but in the parts, it's totally misleading. And you've got people doing profit margin analysis and all sorts of strategic decisions. It's flawed. It's misleading. So the simple definition of ABC is as if the waiter or waitress brings four individual checks. You pay for what you consume. Now, the problem actually begins with this traditional cost center responsibility center statement. I can tell you every manager on the planet Earth recognizes this. But when they receive it, they ask themselves, how much insight and understanding do I get? It just shows me what I spent. I don't know what caused me to have more or less. 
I usually say when managers receive this kind of report, they are either happy or sad. They are rarely any smarter. The problem is not the report, it's a good report. The problem is the data in this format is not structured in a way that you can produce the make them smarter. So all that activity-based costing does is it takes that same $914,000 of what we spent, it translates it into the language of work, ideally with a verb, noun, grammar, and then it reassigns the work cost into the products or customers just like the waiter or waitress with the individual checks. Notice I'm using the back office of an insurance company. It's a factory too. Don't think that this ABC thing is some manufacturing thing. It's pretty universal. When employees actually experience this, they go get an aha moment. They usually used to think that spending began on the left. The spending actually begins at the right side of this diagram. The products and customers place demands on the workload to the left. The workload then draws on the capacity or spending and then the costs measure the effect in the other direction. So demands on work flow right to left, costs are a measure of effect. It's a principle. Rules are many, principles are few, like speed of light and gravity. This is a principle. Unfortunately, many of the accountants violate it when they do these allocations, we'll talk about that. Now I've twisted this, I've rotated it 90 degrees. It isn't as simple as ledger expenses go to activities and we assign them to cost objects. The right side is more realistic. It's multi-stage. You have support departments that do work for other support departments that ultimately support the frontline departments that interact with customers or make products. So it has to be multiple stage. And then I'm gonna take a risk here. I'm gonna take you into a little more detailed slide, uh, but I can't spend much time on it. You can go to my website uh, and I'm retired. I didn't finish that. I'm kind of like semi-retired. My grandsons are 12 and 16 now, and one just got his driver's license, and I retired from SAS three years ago. I'm kind of having fun, and this is fun. Um, but I still like teaching, and so this is a decomposition of the previous diagram very quickly. It has the three universal components of any organization's expense structure. You've got the resources at the top, you got the work activities in the middle, and they will eventually pile up into the, supply, the products of the customers. Uh, you have to adjust your thinking. This is not a flow chart with swim lanes. It's reassigning the same amount of money. So if you start with, let's say, $20 million of January expenses, you will have $20 million of uh, activities, and the $20 million will pile up in that bottom right box customers in something we call business sustaining. Think of those arrows you see as thin straws or wide pipes where the diameter reflects the amount of money that's going through. And in your mind, reverse the arrows the opposite direction. If you could do that, imagine the arrows are now going from bottom to top. That's what's happening in any organization. Every minute, hour, day, week, month, year, the products and the customers are placing demands on the workload. The workload's drawing on the spending and capacity. The costs measure the effect in the other direction. The point here is this, costing is modeling. It is not T accounts and journal entries and debits and credits. You model the expenses into calculated costs. But what's much more important is what does one see after you do all that piping? This is the classic called the profit cliff. Many call it the humpback whale because it looks like a humpback whale. And this is real data that you're looking at. This is a chair company with 850 products on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the net revenues minus the properly traced and calculated cost using ABC. The horizontal axis is the cumulative buildup of the profit by product, but it's rank order from the most profitable product to the next most profitable product and so forth. Eventually you get to break even and you'll notice to the right then you've got unprofitable products. And it's always a shock when management sees this graph. Because in this particular case, what they saw is it said, look, you made roughly $8 million of un unrealized profits on three-fourths of your most profitable products. You lost $6 million on the remainder to net out at two. And that last two data point reconciles exactly with the P&L. And their belief system before seeing this graph is that curve looked like this little anthill with a hook on the end. And what was happening is all that broad brushed averaging, you know, splitting the check four ways was crushing and suppressing 
all of the detection of diversity and variation of which product and all these handling moves and stuff. And it was basically then showing the true picture, not this false picture at the bottom. Now, some of you may be saying, well, what am I supposed to react to? Do I drop the products that are the losers? No, that could be a big mistake. In many cases, organizations will sell losing items with positive items, so they couple them together. Also, quite frankly, cost accounting does not do a good on job on product life cycles. It does period costing, January, February, but it doesn't focus it on a single product. So if you have a new product that's just been released, it may not have sales volume and it's a shakeout period with extra exp expense. But each time you take the snapshot, it would basically start migrating to the positive side. But at least it's fact-based data. At least it's fact-based data. Because remember this, especially for young, you younger people, in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. And usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of your boss or the boss of your boss. So to the degree they are making decisions on gut feel or intuition or flawed and misleading data, your organization's at risk. Let's move on. Strategy, the fifth force. The move from being product-centric to customer-centric. As an example, you go to the five banks up in Toronto, major banks the way Canada's organized, they've all shifted from product managers, you know, deposits, automobile loans, to customer managers, customer-centric, because a customer could buy any of those products. And as I mentioned earlier, customers are viewing suppliers as commodities, so we really need to basically be thinking differently. The only value a company will ever create is the value that comes from its customers, the current customers and the new customers acquired in the future. To remain competitive, one must determine how to keep customers longer, grow them into bigger customers, make them more profitable, serve them more efficiently, and acquire relatively more profitable customers like your existing profitable customers. But we have a couple of problems. Most organizations don't know what the profitability of a customer is. They stop at the product line, so they don't even know how to basically make the comparison. We have another problem. Sales and marketing people pretty much have two goals, grow market share and grow sales. But when we saw that profit cliff, we need to have them grow profitable sales. The problem is there's a big wide gap between the CFO and the marketing and sales people. There's also a gap between operations, but the operations people are doing pretty well. They have lean management, Six Sigma, and other of these process improvement tools. The real issue is strategy. And so somehow we have to close this gap between the finance and accounting function and sales and marketing. Products and standard service lines are not the only thing which accountants should compute costs for. What about all the costs that have nothing to do with making products and delivering standard service lines? The problem with traditional accounting's product gross profit margin reporting is you don't see the bottom half of the picture. And I'm making a case that this bottom half is more important. The top half is sales minus product related costs, draw the line, product gross profit. Below that line, selling, distribution, marketing, customer service, that is much more important, and there's no visibility to it by customer. It's just a line item in the P&L. Visually, what I'm saying is if the entire rectangle here is the entire expenses of an organization, the accountants are primarily only calculating the cost for the material labor and overhead. But what about when we bring in distribution, sales, and marketing? And GNA, I'm saying that's much more important, and it's important for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, one, the internet. The internet is shifting power irreversibly from sellers to buyers. And I just don't mean you all shopping on the internet. Today, a purchasing agent in a corporation with a click of a mouse can see 50 suppliers. And in my day, because I'm an old guy, we couldn't do that. We'd have to phone up three vendors to get comparable prices. This is the next problem, angel customers and demon customers. See, the issue is this. In any organization, you have high-maintenance customers and low-maintenance customers. High-maintenance customers, always shifting schedule, never buying standards, it's always got to be special, always returning goods, always calling help desk. Low-maintenance customers, you love them. Only buy standard, never shift schedule, never call help desk, never return goods. If those two types of customers bought same volume, same mix, same price, they're not equally profitable. 
because the high maintenance one causes you a lot of work. So what this means is highest sales customers are not automatically the most profitable. But what caught my attention about this book, which was written by marketing people, is the subtitle, Discover Which Type of Customer is Which and Turbocharger Stock Price. And this is important because what this means is we need to really start cu connecting customer value creation with shareholder wealth creation. And a lot of salespeople, quite frankly, aren't really clued in. I mean, they'll do price discounts and provide a lot of different services, anything to basically make a sale, which can jeopardize the shareholder wealth creation. So with ABC, you can basically create a profit and loss statement for each individual customer, and the margins are going to be layered like an onion skin because all of those activity drivers, those little pipes that I was showing you in that multi-stage network. And in this fictitious example, if you can see, there was a 30% composite profit margin on products. But between the 30 and the 8, 22 more points of profit margin are eroded, nothing to do with product, all basically channel and customer service. And if you calculate this for every single customer, you can put them as intersections on a grid where the vertical axis is the margin on the mix, which is the above the line, and the horizontal axis is those angels to the left and the devils to the right. And now things become obvious. The most unprofitable customers are in the lower right because they're buying a low margin mix from you for whatever reason and they're high, to high maintenance. The most profitable customers are in the upper left. And now the name of the game is move the dots from the right to the left. Mahmoud, basically, to talk about that, you need to bring in another guest speaker because that's not my job or area. That's marketing people. Cross-selling, upselling. You know, if they buy a set of golf clubs, can I sell them a golf shirt? They buy the golf shirt, can I sell them a second shirt at a discount? Unbundling fee base, like the banks have been doing, and now the airlines are. I hate to tell you, but I had to pay 15 extra bucks to come here to go from a middle seat to an aisle seat. That's going to be. <laughs> uh, you could, <laughs> you could, you could raise price, but that's limited. At the extreme, at the bottom right, fire the customer, terminate the relationship altogether. We're never going to be profitable with this one. So this is the kind of information one can get. All right, budgeting. I already told you, I think the budget is such a disaster. It's so broken, I think you just abandon it altogether. The way many companies do it, quite frankly, is based on some really weird behavior. Part of the problem is when managers are three or four months away from the end of the year and they're not on the glide path to spend all of the budget that was allotted them, what do you think they start doing? They start spending needlessly, foolishly. We call it use it or lose it. And why do they do that? It's because next year's budget is, tends to be basically using the end of this year's as a baseline. They increment it up 3%, 5% for inflation. It's ridiculous. The budget is typically a fiscal exercise by the accountants that has two problems. It's disconnected from the, team, from the executive strategy. You never see strategy in the budget. And it's not based on driver volumes. It's not volume sensitive. What if this department where the manager spending has a 30% increase the next year or a 20% decrease? So my basically point is, if we're going to get rid of the budget, what do we replace it with? What's its purpose? The way to think about this is the amount of capacity that an organization needs at the right is based on two river streams that are coming at it. There's the recurring repeatable expenses that are demand-driven, typically customer demand-driven, and then there's the non-recurring, non-repeatable expenses that are project-driven. And the way to basically resolve this is for the repeatable work, now it's going to get a little bit of economics here, if you can basically get a good costing system for past periods, past month, past quarter, you're going to get a lot of unit-level consumption rates. Those consumption rates are very valuable because when you do the predictive view, you basically forecast the volume and mix times the rate to solve for the level of supply needed, the capacity needed. That's going to be you headcount and spend. It's basically calculating your historical model backwards. For the project-driven work, there are three types of projects to basically go to. If you remember that strategy map with the boxes that Kaplan and Norton the exercise should be for each of those strategic objectives to identify what's a manageable project or initiative that will accomplish that objective and fund it. Now we've actually started to connect strategy to the budget. 
For risk management, the enterprise risk management community is beginning to integrate with the enterprise performance management. And I don't have a slide for it, but if you can imagine a slide where, the, where the, the, it's a grid where I've got basically potential risks is circles all through the grid. The vertical axis is the severity, the impact, if that risk was to happen, low to high. The horizontal axis is the probability that it will happen. So if I'm in the upper right corner, high probability and high impact, I should mitigate that and fund it. So now I'm basically getting risk into the budget or into the plan. Capital expense, capital budget, which we're all familiar with, that's kind of standard, just get your textbook out, and then the strategy budget. We put them all together, if we can calculate that, we're gonna get a good number. Now I'm gonna take you deeper, just for a minute. I've decomposed that diagram. The upper river stream is the shaded boxes to the right, the other three are to the left. Focus on just the one box on the right that says derived budget. Notice the four inputs. From the top, operational budget. Where that's coming from is a good management accounting system will give you those consumption rates. From the left, I've got forecast. If I've got good forecast consumption rates, I'm going to have a good number. I'm going to have a good capacity plan. Industrial Engineering 101, my freshman year at Cornell, volume and mix times rate equals capacity required. I basically then monetize it, euros, pesos, dollars. From the left, notice capital budget, strategy budgets coming from the strategy map risk budget. I'm sharing with you, that's a good number. It's much better than the way these accountants do it today. They have every manager fill out a spreadsheet for their department January through December, line item detail, then they roll it up, which is a big consolidation hassle in Excel anyway. They finally give it to the executives. The executives take a look at it, ah, not good enough, not a profit there, send it back down, and then they go down, everybody fools around, tweaks their Excel spreadsheets, they send it back up, still not good enough, the up, down, up, down, this goes on for a while, finally they get the number. You almost want the executives to say, what the heck number do you want in the first place? And we'll just basically you know, lock in these numbers. It's pretty goofy. Let's move on and basically bring it to the end. How does all this stuff fit together in a single diagram? This is my picture of enterprise performance management. Um, on my laptop, I've got probably 10 other diagrams, but from Gartner, which is an IT research firm, or Forrester, or from IBM or SAP, but they're all IT diagrams. They have all these databases. This is sort of like my, my diagram. Think of it as a circulatory system like the blood in your body, and we'll get into it in more detail. So where's the management accounting and analytics in this diagram? You don't see it. That's because the output of management accounting and analytics is so pervasive, it is the input to so many other places. Uh, you saw that ABC book that was one of my book cover from over 10 years ago. In the appendix, I think I have 131 different types of decisions to use management accounting for. It's all over the place. Okay, how does the diagram work? It starts with that whole customer satisfaction and loyalty. The executives will formulate strategy based on that. Now I know some of you have got bread books from Michael Porter, Five Forces, I'm keeping this simple. The strategy will be formulated based on customer behavior predominantly. The executives will then communicate strategy to employees in a way that they can understand it with the strategy map and identify these key performance indicators. Because remember this, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you can't manage it, you can't improve it. You get what you measure. So measures tend to be important. Once the employees have the measures, that provides feedback to them. So imagine if every employee every day in an organization could answer this one question. How am I doing on what is important? How am I doing on what is important? You know, the first half of that question is actually relatively easy. If they walk in, turn on their computer, they're gonna look at the dial favorable or unfavorable to the target. The second half of the question is the tough one on what is important. And this is this whole exercise of how do I select KPIs, which we can talk about perhaps in a discussion Q&A. Those three arrows are really about strategy execution. Now we've got that targeting, that gap between the CFO and sales and marketing. Because you see, sales and marketing really needs to be answering this question. What types of customers are attractive to retain, to grow, to win back, to acquire? Which types not? Then, how much should we optimally spend 
retaining, growing, winning back customers. And notice I use the word optimally. Why? Because it is an optimization problem. For each segment, and I should really say micro-segment, because marketing really is micro-segment. This is no like a square, male, female, old, young. Man, they've come to have 30, 40 micro-segments. Each one is an optimization, because you can overspend on loyal customers and arguably destroy shareholder wealth. You gave them so much good stuff, they were still going to pay the same volume and mix. But in contrast, you can underspend on marginally loyal customers and risk their defection to a customer. So what is the right amount, pricing, discounts, deals, coupons? This is why the CFO, if some of you are accounting students, you have to basically close that gap with marketing and sales because they're running amok. They're doing a great job over there, but it isn't really in total service to the shareholder. Next comes the whole order fulfillment. Take an order from the customer, complete the order. Admit the hospital patient, complete, heal the patient. That's the whole area of, biz of business process management, Six Sigma Lean, you know, better, faster, cheaper. But good organizational efficiency will never overcome bad strategy execution. We need much more. What we want to do is connect customers to shareholders. Shareholder wealth creation, it's not a goal. It's a result of all of these things working. I love this slide. It was developed not by me, but by a friend. This is happening every minute, hour, day, week, month, year. The problem is it's kind of like arteri arterial sclerosis of your processes. If any one of those arrows is being constrained, it's going to jeopardize the shareholder wealth creation. And some people will ask me, what is the roadmap to complete the full vision of enterprise performance management? And my answer is, there is no roadmap. What there is is there's a beginning, customers, and a destination, shareholders. In between, it's really up to the senior executive team to know what are our needs. If we don't have good cost accounting, maybe we better understand where we make or lose money. If they feel that's okay, but we don't communicate strategy to employees in a way that they understand it and align their behavior with metrics, maybe we should do a strategy. Whatever. My message is don't take years to do this one project at a time each year because there's so much integration between these. And I'll tell you, the technologies, the SAPs, the Oracles, the IBMs, they've got more features and functions that most of their users even use. But to the degree that there is waste, unused capacity, inefficiency, mistargeting of the wrong types of customers. The money doesn't go to the shareholders. It leaks into the sewer. So this diagram is intended to be kind of a vision of what the future might be like. So what's happening here? I believe what's happening is there is a shift in the return on investment from tangible assets to intangible assets. Meaning the shift is from ROI on trucks, machines, software, computer servers to intangible assets like information. And what this graph is showing is that the return on investment from information is growing exponentially as you go from data to information to knowledge to wisdom to insights to those decisions. The problem is most organizations are stuck in the two red bubbles to the left. All they have is raw data and standard reports from a commercial software package. All they can answer is what happened. In some cases, CIO, IT manager gives a few select employees some drill down software like Click, Tableau, Cognos, Hyperion, you may have heard of these. But those managers, all they can answer is what happened. Enterprise performance management begins with the blue bubbles because its first bubble is modeling, costing is modeling. I would argue that a strategy map on one page is a, a, is a model of the executive team's strategy. Once you have modeling, which has causality in it must, not only can you answer what happened, you can answer why did it happen. Then when we move to the predictive view, so we turn 180 degrees, the future's coming at us, then not only can we answer what happened, why did it happen? What can happen? We can do what-if scenario analysis, change an input variable, 
and see what the dependent variables change. Change it again a little bit. See how the dependent variables change. Do that a few times. Sensitivity analysis. All of that. And then at the top is Mount Everest. Optimization. Prescriptive analytics. Of all the choices we could make, what is the best choice? And keep your eye on prescriptive analytics. It's the next step above predictive. That's now we're really using the computer. So... I'm going to skip this one in the interest of time. Um, and I think I've got two minutes to go, right? Let me just end on a frustration that I have. Um, I think I mentioned I'm 66. I did that first ABC in my life in 1988. You may have saw that profit cliff diagram look pretty crummy. That was my very first ABC. It's kind of like your baby's picture you put in the wallet. I said, what after seeing that, this is going to take off like a rocket. In five years, every single organization on the planet Earth will be doing ABC. Well, they're not. But it is not. It's gradual. So what is slowing the adoption rate? Well, one of them are technical barriers. They're IT-related. Dirty data, low-quality data, garbage in, garbage out, that kind of stuff. And also disparate, if you will, sources. You know, I got IBM, I got Dell, I got HP. You know, but those can be overcome. IT services have figured out how to basically put these into a data warehouse. Not a big issue. A second problem are what I call the perception barriers of excess complexity and affordability. Um, many accountants think, oh, ABC is really good. I'd do it, but oh, I'd have to triple the size of the accounting department. Every employee would have to fill out a timesheet. Uh, we'd have 3,000 activities. IT would have to find a driver for each one, and on and on and on. These are all misconceptions. It'll, they, it'll take a year. There's a way to do rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling. You can have a model within four or five or six weeks. Repeatable permanent production system. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Remember, this is management accounting, not financial accounting. Financial accounting, you get the numbers wrong, you go to jail. Management accounting, you get the numbers wrong, you don't go to jail. So, you know, it's okay to have 95%. The level of detail and accuracy depends on what you're going to make. The real problem, though, is these organizational behavior barriers. Technology is not the impediment. It's human nature, resistance to change. People love the status quo. Fear of knowing the truth or other departments or people knowing the truth. Not wanting to be measured, not wanting to be held accountable. Weak leadership, there I said it, you know, not all leadership is great at the top. It's people, not technology. There are two types of managers, Newtonian managers and Darwinian managers. I suspect in this room, the majority of us, because you're here, you are Newtonian managers. To you, the world is a big machine. Give me the levers, give me the pulleys, give me the dials, run it by the numbers. You need to have a little Darwinian. It's an organism, sense and respond. There's this whole people side to it, and we don't have enough of that, and you're, that's how you'll accelerate change. So here's the gears, not the greasy, grimy gears, all the methods. Think of them as titanium spinning faster revolutions per minute. You know, better, faster, cheaper, that's the process. Safer, risk management, smarter, aligned with the... So your success depends on how well and how fast the right information and intelligence gets to the right people. I'm honored, Professor that you, Mahmoud, that you've been using my predictive analytics book, but I want to tell everybody it's not about royalties. Go to Amazon.com, and Chapter 1 is a free download. It's only 15 pages, or my friends here that are graduates. And that's all you really need to read. I wrote Chapter 1, I think, I think to get inspired. So... Action steps, get ed educated, learn how to get buy-in from others, rapid prototyping, these fast techniques, you know, start small, think big, um, and be always conscious of incentives. So there's my website, there's my email address. You're welcome to email me when I have time. <laughs> my junior year, I had a summer job at the Chicago Transit Authority, and I was really idealistic. And I was going to go optimize all the trains and buses because I had this operations research, you know, degree. And I went there the first job, first day, and in the research and development department were all these old bus drivers with ailments and broken legs and stuff. And it was very discouraging. And I realized this is going nowhere. 
And what I'm saying to you is, and then my career went in a different direction. I wish I was 25 years old today like you because it has arrived. The margin for error is thinner. Higher level executives get it. They understand analytics. The computing power is there. The experience is there. You're going to have such a fun career going ahead that I couldn't have, wished I could have. So have fun, good luck, and be analytical. Thank you. Thank you very much.